Good evening. My name is Craig Sankey and I'm the brand manager from DACRA with the responsibility for Philimazol. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to join us today for what's sure to be a fascinating presentation by Tim Williams. Tim's from the Feline Research Group at the Royal Veterinary College in London and his work focuses on feline geriatric medicine, particularly cats with hyperthyroidism and renal disease. The research conducted by Tim and others in the field of feline hypothyroidism is particularly important to DECRA. Making vets aware of findings of such research forms a vital part of our continuing commitment to providing the best support and advice to the veterinary profession. As Tim will discuss in his presentation, it's, a, it's vital to both over, avoid both over and under treatment when medicating hypothyroid cats. Philimazole gives you the flex flexibility you need to keep your patients you thyroid, making it a key product in a vet's end endocrine arsenal. Philimazole dose adjustments can be made in 2.5 milligram increments, providing a total of nine possible dose combinations. This allows vets to closely match treatment with the specific needs of each individual cat. In addition to proven products, DECRA also provides access to our technical team, giving advice and support to anyone treating feline hypothyroidism. The DECRA Academy is also a vital resource to anyone within the veterinary profession. A dedicated online resource, the DECRA Academy contains free online CPD courses, data sheets, product literature and access to the latest information and support. Part of our commitment to support vets work in practice, it's available to you to start using today. And finally, DECRA also supply product specific support materials for your practice. These can include client booklets, waiting room posters, client websites, appointment reminder cards, technical brochures, flowcharts and of course ongoing CPD. Tim is happy to take questions at the end of the presentation. You should use the questions option on the menu shown on the right hand side of your screen. Just type in the question during the webinar and a selection of them will be answered by Tim at the end. Now finally, one other voice you'll hear during the webinar is that of Jamie Walker. Jamie is one of our technical vets here in the UK and he'll be responsible for passing your questions to Tim. So without any further delay, I'm pleased to be able, able to hand over to Tim Williams for this evening's CPD. Okay, good evening everyone. Thanks for joining um, the webinar tonight um, and thanks to Craig for the introduction. So my name's Tim Williams. Um, I'm a PhD student at the you did. research group at the Royal Veterinary College and as Craig said, um, my work focuses on feline geriatric medicine, particularly hypothyroidism and kidney disease in cats. And this evening I'd like to draw your attention to some of our recent research in the area of hypothyroidism and kidney disease in cats. So I'll start with a brief review of hypothyroidism, the physiology of thyroid function and the pathophysiology of hypothyroidism. I'll then move on to discuss the diagnosis, staging and treatment of chronic kidney disease in cats before talking about hypothyroidism and chronic kidney disease in cats, starting with the treatment of hypothyroid azotemic cats and then contrasting this with the treatment of hypothyroid cats which develop azotemia following treatment. And then finally, I'll discuss iatrogenic hypothyroidism in cats and its consequences for renal function and survival. So hypothyroidism is the most commonly diagnosed endocrinopathy in cats and the prevalence of hypothyroidism has recently been estimated to be 6% in apparently healthy geriatric cats which were presented to two London-based first opinion practices. Most cases of hypothyroidism are caused by benign thyroid adenomas or nodular hyperplasia of the thyroid gland. However, rare cases of hypothyroidism can be caused by the presence of a malignant thyroid carcinoma. So thyroid function is controlled by the hypothalamic pituitary axis, which is demonstrated schematically here. The hypothalamus secretes thyrotropin-releasing hormone, or TRH, which stimulates the anterior pituitary gland to release thyroid-stimulating hormone, or TSH. TSH in turn stimulates the thyroid gland to release more thyroid hormones which then act on the target tissue. And thyroid hormone also inhibits further secretion of TSH by the anterior pituitary gland in a classic feedback loop. In hypothyroidism, the adenomatous thyroid gland is able to secrete thyroid hormone independent of control by TSH. The excess thyroid hormone secretion from the abnormal thyroid gland 
also further inhibits TSH secretion by the anterior pituitary gland, therefore TSH concentrations are very low in hypothyroidism. And the treatment for hypothyroidism is therefore aimed at stopping the excessive production of thyroid hormones in order to bring the thyroid hormone concentrations back into the normal range. So we thought we'd start by asking um, the audience a question about how you would treat hypothyroidism. So my first question is, what is your target total T4 for cats treated medically with antithyroid medication which have uncomplicated hypothyroidism? And by uncomplicated hypothyroidism, I mean the cat has no evidence of concurrent chronic kidney disease, cardiac disease, or anything like that that you think is going to suppress the thyroid hormone level. Um, and the reference range um, with the assay you would be using would be 10 to 55 nanomoles per litre. And so would you, um, op for option one, would you aim to simply get the total T4 within the reference range? Would you aim for a total T4 that's below the upper limit of the um, laboratory reference range? Would you aim for a total T4 which lies in the lower half of the laboratory reference range? Or would you aim for a total T4 which is below the middle of the laboratory reference range? And so I'll just open up the poll so that everyone can answer that question. And so you should be able to answer those questions now. <laughs> so we're getting good compliance. We're up 75%. So I'll just give a few more seconds for the last few people to answer the question. Okay, so I'll, I'll just stop it there. And so, you should all see those results there. So, 72% of um, respondents said they would aim for a total T4 in the lower half of the laboratory reference range. 22% of you said you would just aim for a total T4 within the, anywhere within the reference range. And um, I'm going to aim tonight to try and convince the 22% of you um, that said you would aim for um, and, and in fact the 7% who said they would aim for anywhere in the, below the upper end of the reference range that you want to be with the 72% who said they would just aim for it to be in the lower half of the reference range, i.e. between 10 and 35 nanomoles per litre. And that's what I'll aim to do this evening. So we'll move on now. So before we talk about the um, treatment of hypothyroidism in cats with chronic kidney disease, I thought it would be helpful to just review chronic kidney disease itself. So chronic kidney disease, or CKD, is also a very common condition of elderly cats, and it's reported to affect around 30% of cats aged over 15 years. The diagnosis of chronic kidney disease should be based on the documentation of a fasted plasma creatinine concentration above the laboratory reference range in conjunction with evidence of reduced urine concentrating ability. And reduced urine concentrating ability in cats is regarded as a urine-specific gravity of less than 1.035. And I think it's particularly important to ensure that you do get a urine sample from these cats in which you're trying to diagnose chronic kidney disease, as there is a small subset of cats which will have elevated plasma creatinine concentrations which do not actually have um, chronic kidney disease. And so you don't want to overdiagnose chronic kidney disease in those cats. So once chronic kidney disease is diagnosed, it can be helpful to determine the stage of disease. And the International Renal Interest Society has developed a staging system which is based on the measured fasted plasma creatinine concentration. Further substaging has also been proposed based on the urine protein to creatinine ratio and the arterial blood pressure. However, I'm not going to discuss the substaging this evening as that's beyond the remit of tonight's talk, although further information about substaging can be obtained from the iris um, website which is listed there. Um, what's important to remember is that it's only appropriate to stage animals using the IRIS guidelines once the diagnosis of chronic kidney disease has been established and once chronic kidney disease has been deemed to be stable. And a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease can be established in a number of ways. Firstly, the diagnosis may be established by the documentation of a fasted plasma creatinine concentration above the laboratory reference range on at least two occasions, and that should be in conjunction with um, evidence of reduced concentrating ability. 
Secondly, the diagnosis of chronic kidney disease may be established in non-azotemic animals if another renal abnormality is identified. So, for example, if there's a pathological diagnosis of chronic kidney disease on renal biopsy or if persistent proteinuria of glomerular origin is observed. And the iris staging system comprises of four stages, with stage one representing the least severe stage of chronic kidney disease and stage four representing end stage chronic kidney disease. So iris stage one um, includes animals which are non-azotemic, so they have a plasma creatinine of less than 140 micromoles per litre, but these will be um, cats which will have evidence of another renal abnormality, for example, an abnormal renal biopsy result. Stage 2 cats include cats with a plasma creatinine concentration between 140 and 250 micromoles per litre. And the confusing uh, thing here is that this actually spans the upper limits of the reference range for creatinine at most laboratories. But what the important thing to remember is, is that the cutoffs used to diagnose chronic kidney disease in your clinic should continue to be used, those used by whichever laboratory you submit the sample to. So, for example, if your particular laboratory's upper limit of uh, the reference range for creatinine is 177 micromoles per litre, it would be inappropriate to refer to a cat with a creatinine of 150 micromoles per litre um, as having chronic kidney disease when measured by that laboratory, unless another renal abnormality, such as an abnormal um, finding on renal biopsy, was present. So next I'd like to talk about the management of cats with chronic kidney disease and I've got another um, poll for you here. So my question is which of the following do you believe to be the most important treatment intervention for um, chronic kidney disease in cats? And so I'll just open up the next poll for you now. So there's just one answer for this one which is the best answer. So we're up to 70% voted, so I'll just give another 10 seconds or so for the remaining attendees to answer. And I'll stop there as most of you have answered. And 77% of you said renal diet, 21% said ACE inhibitors, 4% said cutaneous fluids, and 2% lorabolin. So, Renal diet is actually the only treatment which has been demonstrated in placebo-controlled clinical trials to improve the survival time of cats with chronic kidney disease. Sorry, I'll just um, move on to that there. Um, it's currently unknown exactly why renal diets are beneficial to cats with chronic kidney disease. Although renal diets are known to reduce plasma phosphate and parathyroid hormone concentrations, and therefore the beneficial effect is thought to be due to this. As secondary renal hyperparathyroidism, which also occurs in chronic kidney disease, could lead to the progression of chronic kidney disease and reduce survival times, as secondary renal hyperparathyroidism could lead to nephrocalcinosis. And so for this reason, the International Renal Interest Society have proposed targets for plasma phosphate concentrations in cats at the various stages of chronic kidney disease. So cats with iris stage 2 chronic kidney disease should have a plasma phosphate concentration of below 1.45 millimoles per litre, which you'll notice is well below the upper limit of the phosphate reference range in most laboratories. And it's thought, if the phosphate levels are allowed to rise above this level, that the plasma PTH concentrations will also increase, therefore allowing secondary renal hyperparathyroidism to develop and potentially for chronic kidney disease to progress. And for cats with higher stages of chronic kidney disease, the target phosphate concentrations are also higher, but you'll notice that both are still well within the reference range for plasma phosphate concentration. So we need to be aiming for plasma phosphate concentrations in these cats with chronic kidney disease that are in the lower half of the plasma phosphate reference range. So then moving on to other possible treatments for chronic kidney disease. So 22% of you, I think, said that you would um, think of benazapril or ACE inhibitors as being the most important treatment intervention. And certainly ACE inhibitors are indicated if persistent proteinuria of renal origin has been demonstrated. And by that, I would mean uh, a UPC of greater than 0.4 have been identified on at least two occasions. 
However, that being said, no significant survival benefit of benazapril has yet been demonstrated in randomized placebo-controlled trials in cats with chronic kidney disease. Certainly, I think potassium supplementation is indicated in cats which are hypokalemic. But I think one of the most important management strategies for chronic kidney disease is to monitor for the development of hypertension and urinary tract infections in these cats. Around 20% of cats with chronic kidney disease will be hypertensive, and around 20% of cats will also have urinary tract infections. And both hypertension and urinary tract infections have the potential to cause progression of chronic kidney disease, and therefore I think these are very important things to, um, to monitor for and treat if they uh, arise. Finally, other treatments that might be considered include anabolic steroids such as lorabilin, supplemental vitamin B12, erythropoietin therapy in anemic patients, calcitriol therapy, and even subcutaneous fluids. Currently, however, there are no clinical studies that have reported that any of these treatments will improve the survival or quality of life of cats with chronic kidney disease. So both hypothyroidism and chronic kidney disease are common diseases of geriatric cats, which can therefore occur at the same time as one another. However, the diagnosis of hypothyroidism in a cat with chronic kidney disease can be complicated because non-thyroidal illnesses such as chronic kidney disease can suppress the plasma total thyroxine concentrations into the normal range, even when hypothyroidism is present. Hypothyroidism can also complicate the diagnosis of concurrent chronic kidney disease, as hypothyroidism causes an increase in the glomerular filtration rate and a reduction in the body muscle mass, which both lead to a reduced plasma creatinine concentration. And this can mask the presence of underlying chronic kidney disease as we use plasma creatinine concentration as a measure of renal function. That being said, 10% of hypothyroid cats will still be azotemic at the time of diagnosis of hypothyroidism. In many cases, therefore, underlying chronic kidney disease only becomes apparent once the hypothyroidism has been treated and reversed. And studies indicate that between 15 and 49% of initially non-azotemic hypothyroid cats will develop azotemia within six months of starting treatment for hypothyroidism. So I'm next interested to know how you would manage a hypothyroid cat which developed azotemia on treatment. So if your lab reference range again was 10 to 55 nanomoles per litre, what would your target total T4 be for a hypothyroid cat which developed stable iris stage 2 chronic kidney disease on treatment? And so just to remind you, iris stage 2 chronic kidney disease would encompass cats which had a plasma creatinine concentration above your laboratory reference range but below 250 micromoles per litre. And so I'll just open that poll up to you now as well. So we're over three quarters of the way there now. We get just about eighty percent. I'll share that with you. And so um, we're pretty tied there. Um, Forty-seven percent of you said that you would aim for a plasma total T4 in the lower half of the reference range. 47% of you said that you would aim for a plasma total T4 in the upper half of the reference range. A small number of you said you would aim to keep the cat mildly hypothyroid, and uh, another small number of you um, aim to make the cats hypothyroid. So um, again, I think what I'd like to try and impress on you today is that you want to aim for a plasma total T4 concentration in this particular circumstance um, of 10 to 35 nanomoles per litre. And so you want to aim for these cats to have, plasma, um, to have a thyroid hormone concentration in the lower half of the laboratory reference range. So before we move on to discuss the effect of the development of azotemia on survival time, it would be useful for us to discuss one of the statistical methods that we use to analyze survival times. So Kaplan-Meier curves, like the one shown on the right in this slide, can be used to show the fraction of a patient population which survived for a certain time from a given starting time point. And in this case, the given starting time point is the time of diagnosis of hypothyroidism. 
And so each notch on the curve represents each time that a patient dies. And therefore, if a large proportion of your patient population die quickly, the curve will be steep, as is the case for the group represented by the green curve in the example shown on the right there. And Kaplan-Meier curves can be used to derive the median survival time, which is the time after diagnosis at which 50% of the patients will still be alive. So on this curve, the group represented by the green line have a median survival time of around 200 days, whilst the group represented by the line in blue have a median survival time of around 550 days. So now we'll look at some examples of how these Kaplan-Meier curves can help us to compare the survival of two groups of cats, this time starting with the hypothyroid cats with and without azotemia at the time of diagnosis. So as you might expect, hypothyroid cats that are azotemic at the time of diagnosis of hypothyroidism have a worse prognosis than hypothyroid cats that are non-azotemic at, at the time of diagnosis of hypothyroidism. And that's lucky for us because this, the, this group is only a very small number of hypothyroid cats, about 10% of hypothyroid cats will fall into this category. Um, and one recent study reported that the median survival time of azotemic hypothyroid cats was only six months whereas non-azotemic hypothyroid cats had a median survival time of around two years. And so with this in mind, I think it's prudent to gradually introduce antithyroid medication in these cases and to monitor renal function carefully as you do so. So hypothyroid cats that are initially azotemic have a poor prognosis. But what is the prognosis for the hypothyroid cats with underlying masked chronic kidney disease that becomes unmasked once you treat them? Well, work from our group has determined that initially non-azotemic hypothyroid cats, which then go on to develop azotemia following treatment, will live just as long as the cats which remain non-azotemic following treatment. And the kaplan meier graph shown here shows this as the curves for the azotemic and non-azotemic cats in green and blue respectively are similar and overlap, therefore showing there's no significant difference in the survival time. So as the development of azotemia after starting treatment for hypothyroidism does not appear to influence the overall survival time, there's currently no indication to undertreat hypothyroidism in the cats which develop azotemia following treatment. Hypothyroidism could potentially cause renal damage to occur through a number of mechanisms, and therefore undertreatment of the hypothyroidism in these cases could allow further renal damage to occur, which could then exacerbate the, the chronic kidney disease that's already present. In addition, suboptimally treated hypothyroidism could have effects on other organs such as the heart, for example by exacerbating underlying hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Therefore, we would recommend that treatment should aim to achieve a plasma total thyroxine concentration in the lower half of the laboratory reference range, even in cats which develop azotemia following treatment. So we've talked about the possible deleterious effects of undertreatment of hypothyroidism. So I'd next like to discuss the implications of overtreatment of hypothyroidism or iatrogenic hypothyroidism. So naturally occurring hypothyroidism in cats is rare, as I'm sure you all know. And the most common cause of hypothyroidism in cats is iatrogenic following radioactive iodine therapy. The prevalence of iatrogenic hypothyroidism in cats treated for hypothyroidism is unknown at the moment, but one preliminary study reported that iatrogenic hypothyroidism was present in around 35% of cats treated with methimazole, and an even greater number of cats treated by thyroidectomy or radioiodine. Iatrogenic hypothyroidism can be difficult to diagnose, however, as non-thyroidal illnesses such as chronic kidney disease can suppress the total thyroxine concentrations to levels below the reference range. In human medicine, measurement of TSH is the gold standard for the diagnosis of hypothyroidism. However, currently no feline-specific TSH assay exists. The canine TSH assay has been validated for use in cats. Feline TSH has 96% structural homology to the canine TSH model. Uh, molecule. However, the K9 TSH assay is reported to only detect 46% of feline TSH. Therefore, the assay has poor sensitivity at low concentrations of feline TSH. However, in hypothyroidism, TSH would be expected to be high, and therefore the poor sensitivity of the assay is less of a problem. So when researching iatrogenic hypothyroidism in our group, We've used a combination of a plasma total T4 below the reference range and a plasma TSH concentration above the reference range as being diagnostic of hypothyroidism. 
We then studied 75 hypothyroid cats that have been treated for hypothyroidism for a six-month period with antithyroid medication alone or in combination with thyroidectomy. And at the end of that six-month um, period, we deemed them to be either hypothyroid or euthyroid. 28 of the cats in this study were hypothyroid and 47 of the cats were euthyroid at the end of the six-month period. And what we found was that 57% of the hypothyroid cats had developed azotemia following treatment, compared to only 30% of the euthyroid cats. So the hypothyroid cats had a significantly higher rate of post-treatment azotemia than the euthyroid cats. And this makes physiological sense because hypothyroidism is known to reduce glomerular filtration rate, and therefore um, iatrogenic hypothyroidism could reduce glomerular filtration rate sufficiently for azotemia to develop in some cases, therefore leading to a higher incidence of post-treatment azotemia in the hypothyroid group. And what's more interesting is that the survival of the hypothyroid azotemic cats was significantly shorter than that of the hypothyroid non-azotemic cats, whereas the survival of euthyroid azotemic and non-azotemic cats were similar. So this suggests that hypothyroidism itself is perhaps detrimental to the survival of azotemic cats, and so dose adjustments of antithyroid medication in cats with iatrogenic hypothyroidism might be indicated in the circumstance. So I've, now that I've um, run through some of the previous um, research that we've done, I thought I'd just summarize some of the suggested treatment protocols for the treatment of hypothyroidism in cats with and without um, chronic kidney disease. So we start with the example of the hypothyroid cats with azotemia at the time of diagnosis of hypothyroidism. So these are the, the, the rarer group, the 10% of hypothyroid cats that we see. So these cats have the poorest prognosis and the ones that you need to handle the most carefully. I think it's important to treat each cat as an individual rather than to have a set protocol for these cats and to gradually introduce antithyroid medication, probably starting at the lowest possible dose. In these cats, you want to aim to reverse the clinical signs of hypothyroidism and ideally achieve a plasma T4 in the lower half of the laboratory reference range. However, if a cat's renal function deteriorates dramatically with treatment, achieving a total T4 in the lower half of the reference range may not always be possible. So then moving on to the hypothyroid cats, which are non-azotemic at the time of diagnosis, um, you want to aim for a plasma total T4 on treatments in these cats in the lower half of the laboratory reference range, regardless of whether or not they develop azotemia. Um, you want to monitor the renal function carefully and start renal diet if azotemia develops. And you also want to regularly recheck the total T4 following treatment. And once treatment has started, the total T4 should be monitored regularly. If the total T4 is within the lower half of the laboratory reference range, the dose should not be adjusted even if, the azote even if azotemia has developed following treatment. However, if the total T4 falls below the reference range, the dose of antithyroid medication should be reduced in small increments until the total T4 is within the lower half of the laboratory reference range. The use of TSH to confirm the diagnosis of hypothyroidism, as we did in our studies, is probably not indicated at present, as most laboratories have not derived reference range for TSH in cats using the canine TSH assay. So finally, I thought it would be good just to discuss a case that was recently seen in one of our geriatric cl uh, clinics, as it demonstrates many of the important aspects of the management of hypothyroid cats with chronic kidney disease quite well. So this is Suki, who was a 17-year-old female neutered domestic short herd cat who presented to us with a history of weight loss and polyuria. So on clinical examination, Suki had significant dental disease. She had an unkempt coat. There was evidence of muscle wastage bilateral goiters were palpated, and she had small, smooth kidneys. Her heart rate was 230 beats a minute. Her systolic blood pressure, as measured on Doppler, was 156 to 160 millimeters of mercury, so at the upper end of the normal range. Her weight was 2.06 kilograms, and her body condition score was 2 out of 9, so she was pretty skinny at this point. And so we took um, blood and urine as standard for our clinics, and I've summarized the results of the biochemistry on the left with the uh, total T4 results at the bottom there, and the results of the urinalysis on the right. And so you can see that the total T4 is clearly elevated, so she was clearly hyperthyroid. 
Um, if we look at the plasma creatinine concentration, that was normal, and so she was non-azotemic at this point. You'll notice the plasma urea concentration is elevated. However, plasma urea is a relatively unreliable marker of renal function, particularly in hypothyroidism, as um, plasma urea concentration can be increased in um, states of protein catabolism, of which hypothyroidism is one. The urine-specific gravity was uh, relatively concentrated there at 1040. And so uh, at this point, we saw no real evidence of um, chronic kidney disease. Interestingly, you'll notice that there was 2 plus protein on the dipstick. Uh, this is not unusual for cats with hypothyroidism, as mo many cats with hypothyroidism will be proteinuric, and the proteinuria will resolve following treatment of the hypothyroidism. We also performed a sediment exam on the urine, which is something that we do as standard in our clinics, and I think is uh, something that could be performed more in first opinion practice. It's a very good way to screen urine for um, the presence of urinary tract infections. And in Suki's case, we did actually see cocci on the, um, on the sediment exam, and so we sent it for urine culture, which, uh, from which we cultured Staphylococcus aureus. And whilst we're on the subject of urinary tract infections, I thought it would be interesting to ask um, whether you knew what proportion of cats with hypothyroidism will have urinary tract infections. And so this is our next poll, which I'll just open for you now. So the options are 2%, 5%, 12%, or 25%. And so I'll just launch that for you now, and you can all vote on that one. So we're up to 75% mark now, so I'll just close that poll in a second. Okay, great. Well, the majority of you got it right. Um, the prevalence has been reported to be 12% in hyperthyroid cats. Um, we're not entirely sure why hyperthyroid cats get so many urinary tract infections. It's known that there are modulated immune responses which have been shown experimentally in hyperthyroidism. However, hypothyroidism has not been associated with immune compromise or an increased likelihood of infection in humans or rats. It could be postulated that the increased prevalence of UTIs is related to the presence of underlying chronic kidney disease and therefore dilute urine specific gravity, although several studies have identified no associations between um, dilute urine and the prevalence of urinary tract infections. And indeed, in our experience, urinary tract infections can and do occur in um, urine in concentrated urine, as is as was the case in Suki's um, in with Suki here. So we started her on methimazole, two and a half milligrams twice daily, and also started her on amoxicillin clavulanate for the urinary tract infection, and we reassessed her three weeks later. And at that three week time point, um, she had, uh, the only thought she'd gained weight and her appetite had increased. Her heart rate was 200 beats per minute. Systolic blood pressure was still at the high end of the normal range, but she gained about 300 um, grams in weight, and her body condition score had improved. So she seemed to be doing pretty well clinically at this point. And on repeat biochemistry, um, you can see that the plasma total T4 was nicely in the lower half of the laboratory reference range where we wanted it to be. Um, her plasma creatinine had increased quite markedly from around 90 to 162. However, this wouldn't be unexpected as the treatment of hypothyroidism will lead to a reduction in the GFR and also will have led to an increase in the body muscle mass, which both will contribute to an increase in the plasma creatinine concentration. However, at this point, she was still non-azotemic and her urine-specific gravity was still concentrated at 1041. So all seemed to be well. Um, until we saw her back another two months later, so this is three months after starting treatment, when the owners thought that she was doing um, okay, although they did report that her vision was deteriorating. And so at this point, her heart rate was 192 beats per minute, and she developed a grade 3 of 6 systolic murmur. Her systolic blood pressure now had risen to 180 to 186 millimeters of mercury, which is in the danger zone as far as uh, we would be concerned in our clinics, we tend to treat any cat with a blood pressure of over 160 millimeters of mercury as being suspicious of hypertension. And at that point, we will then take steps to try to definitively diagnose hypertension 
specifically by uh, performing a retinal exam to look for evidence of hypertensive retinopathy. And in Suki's case, when we did a retinal exam, we saw evidence of bullous detachment in both eyes, which confirmed the diagnosis of hypertension. Um, studies from our group have determined that around 10% of hyperthyroid cats are hypertensive at the time of diagnosis of hyperthyroidism. However, we've also observed that a further 20% of hyperthyroid cats, which are normotensive at the time of diagnosis of hyperthyroidism, will actually develop hypertension once you start treating the hyperthyroidism. And this seems to occur a median of five months after the start of treatment. And therefore, it's important to monitor blood pressure in hyperthyroid cats, not only at the time of diagnosis, but also following treatment. And it's also interesting to note that the development of hypertension does not always, is not always associated with the unmasking of chronic kidney disease either. So it does seem to um, occur independent of that effect. And so at this point, we took another plasma biochemistry, and you'll see that the plasma creatinine concentration had increased markedly from 160 to 320 at this point. And now the urine-specific gravity was dilute at 1022, which confirmed the diagnosis of chronic kidney disease. And so um, the important point I wanted to make here is that the plasma creatinine concentration will actually continue to rise for around three months after the, after the re-establishment of euthyroidism. And therefore, I don't think you can rule out concurrent chronic kidney disease in hypothyroid cats until the cat's been euthyroid for at least a three-month period. You'll also notice that at this point, the plasma total T4 was now suppressed down um, below the limit of detection. And so feasibly, the hypothyroidism could be contributing to the degree of azotemia, and perhaps adjusting the dose might reduce the degree of azotemia, although I don't think the cat would actually become non-azotemic if you did manage to um, restore euthyroidism in this case. So um, the just um, one final, another poll for you. Um, I wanted to ask what you would do next with this case. So you've got five options here. Would you check the urine protein to creatinine ratio? Would you start renal diet? Would you start benazepril? Would you start amlodipine? Or would you reduce the methimazole dose? And this time there are actually multiple answers that you can give. Um, so give whichever answers you deem are appropriate in this case. I've just launched that for you now. So vote on which, whichever options you would do. Okay, so I think the majority of you have voted there, so I'll just close that poll. Actually, there was a slight mistake on the, the fifth option there, which was measure TSH, which was my fifth option, but I was told I wasn't allowed to have six options, so I had to reduce it down to five, and I took out measure TSH. Um, but I'll discuss each of these in turn. So 64% um, of you said that you would check the urine protein to creatinine ratio, and certainly um, that would be indicated if persistent significant proteinuria was observed, and I think on, in, in Suki's case, uh, on the protein dipstick at the end there, she was, uh, it was 2 plus. Um, however, hypertension will also increase the UPC, and so I think it would be best to retest the UPC um, once the hypertension was controlled. Starting renal diet, I think, would certainly be indicated, as 86% um, of you said. 32% um, of you suggested starting benazepril, which, again, uh, would be indicated if persistent proteinuria was observed. But as I just said, I think it would be best to consider this once the blood pressure was controlled. So control the blood pressure, retest the UPC, and if the, um, the proteinuria is still evident, um, then at that point you can start benazepril. Also um, worth adding that benazepril is not a very effective drug for controlling blood pressure in cats. My first choice um, antihypertensive agent in cats would be amlodipine, as it's a much more effective drug. Um, amlodipine um, tends to reduce the um, systolic blood pressure by about 50 millimeters of mercury, whereas benazepril will only reduce the systolic blood pressure by about 10 millimeters of mercury. And so certainly I think amlodipine would be indicated in this case as we've confirmed a diagnosis of hypertension, particularly with the, um, with the uh, documentation of retinal lesions as well. So that certainly needs to be started um, in order to prevent any further renal damage from occurring. And um, the final option um, 
to reduce the methimazole dose, um, I think that would be indicated as well, as this will reduce the, um, the degree of azotemia that we see. And as a, a few of you might have said, to measure the TSH, um, as I said, this could help to determine if hypothyroidism was present. However, actually, TSH production is suppressed in the hypothyroid state, and this state of suppression will persist for around four to six months following the restoration of euthyroidism. And so it's probably too early to test the TSH at this point, as the cats will need a new thyroid for two to three months anyway. Plus, um, TSH is not widely available. Um, you know, a, a TSH reference range is not widely available as yet, so um, I don't think that would be indicated at this point. So in Suki's case, if you were to readjust the, um, the dose uh, of the antithyroid medication, what would your target total T4 be in Suki's case? So we've just got um, one last poll for you now. <laughs> There you go, just launch that for you there. Excellent, so I think most of you have now voted. So I'll just close the poll and share those results with you. So 86% um, of you said you would aim for a plasma total T4 in the lower half of the laboratory reference range. Still 12% of you would aim for a total T4 in the upper half of the laboratory reference range, and 2% of you said you would um, maintain the, the uh, total T4 below the laboratory reference range. Well, um, I would still say that you want to aim for a total T4 in the lower half of the laboratory reference range in Suki's case, as she was a, a non-azotemic cat which developed azotemia following treatment, and I think with dose adjustment, the, uh, her degree of azotemia would probably um, put her in the um, high stage 2 or low stage 3 category, um, and I, I think her survival would probably be equivalent to that of cats which didn't develop azotemia following treatment. Um, given the results that we've found. Um, and so I think option two would be the, the best um, outcome for Suki in this case. Um, so I've just got some take-home messages from Suki's case and from the talk in general. Um, so the unmasking of chronic kidney disease, iris stage two or three, in initially non-azotemic hypothyroid cats shouldn't lead to a reduction in dose of antithyroid medication as the unmasking of, of chronic kidney disease chronic kidney disease doesn't seem to adversely affect their survival. And equally, overdosing of antithyroid medications should also be avoided. So the bottom line, I think, is that we should be aiming for a plasma total T4 in the lower half of the laboratory reference range in all hypothyroid cats, which are initially non-azotemic. Um, also, around 15 to 49% of hypothyroid cats will develop azotemia following treatment. Um, however, normal renal function, I don't think, can be assumed until the euthyroidism has been restored for at least three months, um, as it takes around three months for body muscle mass to return to normal. And that was demonstrated quite nicely in Suki's case. And also, around 20% of hypothyroid cats will develop hypertension following treatment, as Suki did, and not necessarily. It, she will, you know, Suki didn't develop hypertension at the first visit when um, she came in and she was euthyroid. It, it developed subsequent to that. And therefore, I think it's important to check blood pressure in hypothyroid cats at the time of diagnosis of hypothyroidism and following treatment, even in cats without evident chronic kidney disease. And so that concludes my uh, webinar this evening. Um, I hope you've found it useful. And then certainly, if you do have any questions you want to ask, please feel free to send Unmuted. Um, Jamie and he'll collate them and uh, we'll ask the most popular ones to me, I think, now. So I'll pass back over to Jamie at this point and have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, Tim. Uh, my name is Jamie Walker, and as Craig said earlier, I'm one of the veterinary technical advisors at DECRA. And on behalf of DECRA and everyone who's attended tonight's webinar, I'd just like to thank Tim for a really excellent presentation with lots of practical, clinically relevant advice. I'd also like to thank everyone who's joined us for the webinar this evening. We certainly hope that you found it interesting and that you'll attend further DECRA webinars in the future. Now, at the end of the webinar, there will be a short electronic questionnaire for you to fill in. 
But first of all, Tim has very kindly agreed to stay on for a few minutes and answer some of the questions you've submitted. We've had quite a few questions come in. We've only got time for a few, um, so apologies if your question isn't asked. Um, but we'll just start with um, one question here. Uh, and we've had a question on how important is fasting um, to, for a measurement of the creatinine level? Uh, and if fasting is important, how long should you fast them for? Okay, um, certainly if, uh, the feeding of um, food can increase the, um, you know, the, the creatinine and the urea. Um, so in a borderline case, I think you could get a, um, you know, an inaccurate result. Although I think if a cat is azotemic, if it has um, chronic kidney disease, probably fasting them isn't going to make a huge difference to the plasma creatinine that you measure. Although in a borderline case, it might make some difference. So ideally, you do want to fast them. Um, and ideally, I think you want to fast them for about eight, nine hours before you take any blood samples. OK, thanks very much, Tim. Um, the next question we've got is, if you diagnose a cat as hyperthyroid on the basis of an elevated free T4, and its total T4 is sort of mid to high end of the reference range, how do you then monitor that cat? Um, do, you, do you use total T4 or free T4 to monitor? Um, I think in those cases we tend to look more at the total T4, probably more out of ease than anything, and also looking clinically at the cat. Um, I think generally we we tend to diagnose hypothyroidism based mostly on total T4 um, because we've we've found the free T4 assay to not be that useful to us in that I tend to find that in the equivocal cases the cats which come back with the sort of mid to high end total T4s persistently, the free T4 has often ended up coming back in the middle of the reference range or you know, at the higher end of the reference range as well. So I think if hypothyroidism is a real problem in a cat, the, the cat is going to become hypothyroid eventually and, and in those cases I think it, it is better to just monitor the cat and see it back four to eight weeks later, retest the total T4 and try and pin down the diagnosis based on that. Um, I think if you're really chasing a diagnosis of hypothyroidism using free T4s, um, then there's probably another significant problem that's suppressing that total T4, and the hypothyroidism probably isn't the most pressing issue to the cat. So um, we we tend to look more at total T4s, to be honest, um, than than free T4s. Plus, it you know it's cheaper anyway, and also look at how the cat's doing clinically. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we've got a question on hypothyroidism and renal disease. So if a cat does develop hypothyroidism on medical treatment, um, but it's got no clinical signs of hypothyroidism and it's not azotemic, should you still reduce the dose of antithyroid medication? Yeah. So, um, I mean, if you look at the survival data, then I would say there's no significant difference in the survival time of a hypothyroid non-azotemic cat against a, a euthyroid um, non-azotemic cat. However, by keeping them hypothyroid, you are potentially reducing their glomerular filtration rate. Um, you're increasing the risk of them developing chronic kidney disease. And but it, the um, hypothyroid cats also have other abnormalities, such as lower pack cell volumes, um, lower bone turn turnover, lower heart rates. and all of these things may contribute to potentially to um, renal damage, for example, through um, the induction of renal hypoxia if there is reduced PCV, for example. Um, also, if a, if a cat, I think the, I think clinical signs of hypothyroidism in cats are quite difficult to appreciate as um, the clinical signs would be lethargy and reduced appetite. And certainly in a treated hypothyroid cat, I think a lot of owners report that their cats become more lethargic and is eating less because the cat was very active and eating a lot when it was hypothyroid. So I think it's quite difficult to assess clinical signs of hypothyroidism um, in cats. Um, and so I, I would still personally recommend um, adjusting the dose. Okay, thank you. Um, and we've got another question on hypothyroidism here. So if a cat um, develops hypothyroidism after surgery or radioiodine, should you actually be giving that cat thyroid hormone? Um, and if, if so, how long would you wait for thyroid hormone levels to recover before you started supplementing it with thyroid hormone, if that's what you'd recommend? Yeah. Well, I think it, um, it would be worth waiting probably for about six months after radioactive iodine or um, surgery because um, 
the thyroid hormone levels do tend to recover given time. Um, but if after that point there was still evidence of hypothyroidism, and particularly if the cat was azotemic, I think I would be inclined to um, supplement them and look at the effect on um, on their renal function, uh, particularly if they're quite mildly azotemic. But I think I would wait for about six months to see if the thyroid gland recovers function first of all. I mean, unfortunately, we haven't got any data to look at whether or not supplementation of um, of thyroid hormones in cats following radioactive iodine therapy is beneficial because a lot of those cats will actually be hypothyroid for a time, although I think in general the hypothyroidism does reverse um, after a few months, although it would be really interesting to look at whether um, cats which were supplemented did actually have improved survival times over the cats which weren't, but unfortunately that study is yet to be done. Okay, just one more if that's okay, Tim. Um, yeah. And this is on um, if there's any way of predicting which cats will have unmasking of kidney disease when you treat the hypothyroidism. You said it sort of occurs in up to about half of cases, so is there any way of knowing which cases it's going to happen in? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, there's been um, conflicting reports in the literature as to whether or not there are predictors of unmasking of chronic kidney disease. Some papers have reported that cats with lower urine specific gravities are more likely to develop chronic kidney disease and um, some papers have reported that cats with higher total T4s are more likely to develop chronic kidney disease. Whereas other papers have, you know, I, when I, in the studies I've done, we've um, not really found any um, significant predictors of the development of post-treatment azotemia other than the plasma creatinine concentration. Um, so essentially cats with a higher plasma creatinine concentration when they're hypothyroid will tend to be those ones which will develop azotemia following treatment which is kind of um, you know what you would expect but other than that there's not really any um, solid predictors of, of the development of azotemia following treatment. Proteinuria doesn't seem to be a predictor, the presence of um, concurrent hypertension doesn't seem to be a predictor, um, urine specific gravity tends to be lower, but as, as was the case in the, in the um, with Suki there at the end, she started with a relatively concentrated urine when she was hypothyroid and, and developed chronic kidney disease within, um, within three months. So um, urine specific gravity really isn't a very good predictor of post-treatment renal function. I think the only thing you can really look at is the plasma creatinine, but um, you know, there's no actual cutoff that we have as such uh, at which we can say, well, cats with a creatinine over this will all develop azotemia and cats with a creatinine under this won't develop azotemia. And that's partly because of differences in the body muscle mass between hypothyroid cats. Um, you know, because a cat with a creatinine of 150, which is, has no muscle on it at all, is, is much more likely to develop azotemia than a cat, say, with a, with a similar plasma creatinine, which has normal muscling. Okay, thanks very much, Tim. Uh, and sorry, we have just got time for one more question, if that's all right, Tim. Um, yeah, okay. Someone's asked um, that you've used a, a nine-point um, body condition scale, um, oh, yeah. Suki. Um, I think there are sort of other body condition scores out there. So is, is the nine-point scale sort of the commonly accepted one to use now? We use it because it's a more accurate way of, of assessing body condition score um, because the five point scale, you know, we were only using half points so we just we, we uh, switched to the nine point scale which I think, is, I think is more commonly used now in sort of nutrition circles and things like that. So yeah, we've, we've switched to that now um, and we've also recently started looking at muscle condition scoring, although that, that's something that's not been um, validated as yet, but it is something that I think it's important to also consider muscle condition as a lot of um, cats with chronic conditions will tend to lose muscle um, more so than fat, and so you can get a, a reasonably fat cat which actually has very little muscle on it. So I think it's important to assess the muscle as well as the, the actual body condition. Okay, that's lovely. Thanks very much. Well, we've run out of time now, unfortunately. Um, but once again, many thanks, Tim, for presenting a really interesting summary of your research. If anyone has any further questions, you are, of course, welcome to contact the technical team at DECRA. And you can do that by phone on 01939 211 200. That's 01939 211 200. Or by email at technical at DECRA.com. Uh, and like I say, apologies if we haven't been able to answer um, your question tonight, but if there are questions you'd still like answered, 
please feel free to, to get in touch with us on that phone number or at that email address. In a few moments when the webinar is finished, a very short questionnaire will pop up on your screens and we'd be really grateful if all attendees could just take a few moments to fill this in. Your feedback is really valuable to us and it does help us to plan future webinars and CPD events. Okay then, all that remains for me is to say good night and we hope to see you again soon for another webinar. Thank you very much for attending. Goodbye.